Well, good evening, folks, and welcome once again as we spend some time in the Word of God. I'm both grateful but want to ask you to specifically pray this evening for another issue. I know we pray about many things, but uh, this morning I dropped the kids off at school and I went out. I was going to go out and, uh, and see one of my old members who's dealing with some real health challenges in Rocky Mountain House, and I had... I had just gotten there and, and uh, was going to uh, sit down and have a little visit and, and see how things were when I got a call from the school where my kids go to school. And and I was told that my little Eden had fallen um, uh, off of uh, the uh, monkey bar equipment at the school and, and uh, uh, was not responding very well and, and, and was in, not in good shape. And so I got in my truck and I put my hazard lights on and I probably scared half the citizens of Alberta between Rocky Mountain House and, and the Lacombe School uh, and uh, got Nana to help out to get the kid, get to eat into the hospital quicker than I could get back. Uh, Lillian was away with some appointments uh, and, and I couldn't reach her. So I got to emergency almost at the same time as Nana who had come and picked her up and took her from the school to the hospital. Um, where we met with the doctor and uh, she was still not really responding very much um, and uh, anyways they determined she has a a bad concussion uh, and we are right now still in the monitoring stages as I'm recording this uh, for the next six hours in case there was any uh, bleeding in her brain or swelling that could cause other issues so I want to ask you um, please pray for my little Eden um yeah during this time and i just hope that uh that she has a speedy recovery um now let's continue with our study for this evening father in heaven lord we recognize especially at parents how you must feel when we mess up and you just want to step in and fix everything but it's not always that easy sometimes you have to have to just let things play out um and Lord, I'm understanding that pretty clearly today as a father who wishes I could do more. Uh, Lord, we pray that you will be with little Eden and help her to get better very quickly. And I ask that as we spend some time today reading and studying and continuing in our discussion uh, off the story of the wise and foolish virgins, Lord, that we, of course, would be part of the wise, part of the church that is ready, remembering that the wise and the foolish represent Christians, People who are in the right church, people who have the right doctrine, but have not taken the time with Jesus that is necessary. The time to be acquainted with the Holy Spirit, the oil that is so necessary for us to have the experience we need for when you come in the clouds of glory. Lord, we pray just now you will be with us and grant us your peace and your grace and your mercy as we study. Clear our minds from the worries and the cares and the troubles of this world so we can spend uninterrupted time with you, Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, folks. Uh, once again, uh, we're continuing uh, from the passage of the story of the wise and foolish virgins. Uh, if you would like, of course, you could pause very briefly here and uh, you could go and read that again. Um, but today we are on page 16 in our book, Boot Camp for the Last Days, uh, and we are still dealing with uh, responding to the story of the wise and foolish virgins. So here we go, continuing. The primary focus of the story is the church's preparedness at the second coming. But I wonder whether there was a parallel with the preparedness of Jesus' generation for his first coming. It was almost as if the present experience of the disciples was a preview of what would be happening with the disciples at the end of time. And now they expound on this a little bit. Luke 17, uh, 22 to 24. Um, once on being like the Pharisees, asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, and he replied in this way, Luke 17, 22 to 20 to 22, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Then he said to his disciples, the time is coming when you will long to see the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. 
This is the same attitude Peter describes as the scoffers in the last days, in the days in which you and I are living. Where's the promise of his coming, they say? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they were from creation. Second Peter 3, verse 4. You know, I could even be saying that. I don't because I recognize that time is short. Jesus is coming soon. But I remember my dad preaching the same message. Jesus is coming soon. When I was a little boy, the Cold War was going on. All of the events were in place, uh, seemingly like they are today, though not quite as catastrophic in my dad's day. Uh, but he was saying, I don't believe the world will last another 10 or 20 years. I really believe Jesus is coming in my lifetime. Now my dad has passed along and I am saying the same thing and I'm telling my children the same thing. But remember, the Bible says that our salvation is nearer now than when we first believe. Jesus coming every day we live is a day closer. He will come. He is coming very soon. And when he does come, there won't be any things like concussions or falling off swings or the kind of worry that I've gone through today uh, dealing with my little girl. And I, I'm sure that the Lord will lead us through this situation and things will be okay. But it's so hard to be a father loving your daughter and knowing there's not much you can do but just be there for her. And I'm sure that my Heavenly Father, when I trip and fall and stumble on the the issues that I face in life, probably says, I wish I could get in there and force change. I wish I could make them better or do that. But our loving God has to allow us to make our mistakes and to work through them and to have a closer experience with them as we come out of them. So I, for one, will not be one of those men who say, well, my father said it and his father said it. It's not happening in my time. Brothers and sisters, I believe Jesus is coming very soon. Do not scoff. Do not mock. Lift your head. Look towards the eastern sky. The coming of the Son of Man dry is drawing near. Let's get back to our story. Three years had passed since John the Baptist had announced that the kingdom of God was here. Now the Pharisees are skeptics and they're asking Jesus, where's the kingdom you keep talking about? And Jesus says, it's not the kind of kingdom you're looking for. I'm not going to come in here and I'm not going to crush the Romans and set up some earthly kingdom. We are looking for something much better a place whose builder and maker is not of this world. In Luke, in Luke 22, verse 20, in 1722, Luke records Jesus' words The time is coming when you will long to see the Son of Man, but you will not see it. They didn't realize what a great privilege they had in having the living word of God with them in their very presence. And one day they would kick themselves for not taking greater advantage of the privilege they had. And I will say to you and I, right now we have the Bible right here. I can read this whenever I like. Am I taking full advantage of my ability to read and study God's word, to fill myself with the oil of the Holy Spirit? Because there may be a day coming when I can't have this book in front of me. I may be locked up. Bibles may be taken away. I may not have the same access. Today I do. Today I need to spend my time in the word of God, studying to show myself approved, studying to know the will of God for my life studying to have my lamp absolutely full of oil. So when the bridegroom comes a knocking and says, hey, I'm here, time to go to the wedding feast, I can jump up and say, Lord, I'm ready. I pray that is your experience too. If the word of God is a light to our path, what kind of illumination is the living word? The disciples had been with him, but they had not known or appreciated him. In this sense, we see that Jesus' entire generation slept at the time of his first coming. The Pharisees and the disciples were all asleep to who Jesus was really, uh, to who Jesus really was and the nature. Uh, they were asleep to who Jesus really was and to the nature of his mission. The coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost was the awakening for the disciples after they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the oil, they finally understood his teachings, his miracles, his prophecies, and about him. It's no surprise that the Spirit is often described as the seven-fold Spirit of God. Isaiah 11 and 2 calls it the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of God. Everything they lacked before was available for them in great supply. They were as men awakened from a dream. 
This occurrence parallels Matthew 25, verse 7. All the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. So, brothers and sisters, we need to learn from this early experience of the disciples who were, in essence, sleeping until they finally got the Holy Spirit. And praise the Lord, they weren't at the time you and I were. They were able to still get that oil fill their lamps, and then go out and keep a bright burning light going for Jesus. You and I, at the end of time, need to have our lamps fully filled. We need to learn from the experience of the disciples. We need to do a better job of understanding this word of God, of reading it while we have it in hand. Because, as I said, when the bridegroom comes and says, wake up, I've got a job for you, it's too late for you and I to go scurrying around, trying to gain access to the Holy Spirit, trying to fill ourselves with the word of God, because there is a day coming when it will be too late to choose. So today, right now, in this moment, pick up your Bible, open it up and start reading. You don't know how much time you have. I don't know how much time I have. It's very clear to me with the things, how fragile life can be. This morning, I dropped five happy, healthy little kids off. This afternoon, I'm sitting with one of my children, wondering, will she be okay? You and I have today, we have these moments, and each and every one of them is precious. And we need to use each and every moment we have to spend time with Jesus, to fill our minds with his word, and to teach our children the same. Because you and I are the ones that can share the great light, the great hope of the gospel with each and every one we come in contact with. This occurrence parallels Matthew 25, 7. All the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The disciples woke up after they received the oil. At least with the disciples, uh, we could cut them some slack because they didn't receive the gift yet. But what is your excuse? What is my excuse? We have the gift and we've had it now for 2,000 plus years. The Holy Spirit is available to us, but we neglect him. The results of receiving him are the same. Waking up from the dream, understanding who he is and what it means to be saved, to be ready for the wedding and to be serious about the war. Looking back on the opportunities that were theirs, the disciples saw how dimly they'd comprehended the prophetic scriptures, how slow they'd been to understand his mission and nature. They were ashamed that their faith had been so feeble and that their ideas had been so wide of the mark. What were we thinking? Is this not sometimes an all too accurate description of our spiritual condition today? Do we struggle with dim comprehension, poor understanding, feeble faith, and off the mark ideas about the kingdom right now? Why is this? Why don't we have greater understanding? Are we going through the same experiences? Are we taking things for granted when we should be sharpening our skills? The disciples were filled with remorse because they had allowed the prevailing unbelief to leaven their opinions and be cloud their understanding. What are we allowing to cloud our understanding? And of what physical and what of the physical connection? If our bodies, Paul says, are the temples of the Holy Spirit, are sick and taxed to their limits due to fatigue, uh, um, due to fatigued organs that are stressed by trying to overcome the lack of exercise or the poor diets, lack of sleep, and drugs, can our minds, which are already overstimulated, grasp, grasp the truth of scriptures? What our author is saying here is our entire life needs to be ordered and principled to understand God better. Let's not let our faculties wax. Let's not let our bodies fall apart. Let's treat our temple of God as though it is the temple of God. Let's sharpen and hone every faculty. Let's make sure our lamps are trimmed and burning brightly. And let's make sure that our the oil is completely full. Let's make sure we are filling ourselves with the Spirit of God on a daily basis. Boot camp is about getting a soldier physically, mentally fit for battle. God's boot camp for the last days is about the same thing. And 
I cooperate by removing whatever obstructs the Holy Spirit from dwelling in me. We need to be at our clearest, our sharpest, to discern truth from error, to appreciate the truth and the work of God, to take our stand on the front lines of the battleground, the principalities and powers, and so on, to contra er, counteract the prevailing unbelief, dim comprehension, poor understanding, and off-the-mark ideas about the kingdom of God and prepare for the coming of the bridegroom. We're going to boot camp. Remember, folks, we're still in the introduction of this book. It gets better and better as we go. We're going to do it together. We're going to do what the disciples did, search the prophecies, rehearse the teachings of Christ, but we must have what they had to be successful, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or we will not comprehend. The disciples had been with him, but had not known or appreciated him. Imagine going to church all these years, listening to countless sermons and not knowing him or appreciating him. Is that something you've done? Is that something I could have done? Is it possible that we've been in church? going to church, going through the motions, but not allowing Jesus to come in and change our hearts and minds. That changes today, brothers and sisters. That changes at this very moment. As we close our meeting today, you're going to get on your knees. You're going to bow your head. You're going to say, Lord, I repent. Lord, fill me with your spirit. I want to be ready when Jesus comes. going to read a last little piece here from our author. I have a confession to make. I am more excited about the concept of boot camp than I am actually am about going. The thought of preparing myself to enter encounter God more deeply is more appealing than actually preparing myself. I find myself a rabid fan of watching the Olympics on TV rather than being an Olympian. Can you relate? So the idea of reformation is more exciting than actually doing it is what he's saying that can be the case. We're going to move from the idea of boot camp, from the idea of becoming better Christians to actually doing it. We're not going to sit and watch it happen in front of us and watch the church grow and grow and move. We're going to be part of it. We're going to stop being in the stands just cheering and clapping uh, for the home team. We're going to be the home team. We're going to be the people that loudly proclaim this gospel of the kingdom to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people so Jesus can come and we can all go home. I hope I can hear an amen. Let's bow our heads, let's ask God to be with us, and let's ask him to bless as we begin this journey through boot camp. I hope this introduction has got you excited. If you uh, would like, call your friends, tell them to join uh, each evening moving forward as we will beginning, be beginning our first actual chapter past the introduction chapter tomorrow night. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, it's been a rough day but I can still feel the peace that passes understanding somehow, knowing that you've got this, that I can trust you with my children, I can trust you with my family, I can trust you with my life. I have to say at times, forgive my unbelief, forgive when I try to step in and worry more than I need to, because I know, Lord, that you have everything in control. You know the end from the beginning. Help me to rest in that peace today. And I thank you for all my brothers and sisters who I know will also be praying for my little girl as we just see how she's going to come through this. Oh Lord, I ask you will be with us now and bless us as we are on this journey, this journey of deeper preparedness for your coming. Lord, we desire to know you better, to love you more, to proclaim you louder than we ever have to a world in need. But for any of that to happen, we need your Holy Spirit desperately. Come, Lord Jesus, and fill us, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, brothers and sisters, have a wonderful rest of your evening. We'll see you again tomorrow night.